Hi, I'm Dr. Ralph Levinson, Health Sciences Professor Emeritus at UCLA. And I'm Luc Levitansky, a French journalist covering technology, politics, and power. Welcome to your Planet Your Health, where we share stories about the environment without falling prey to despair. In these conversations, we explore the knowledge and tools we can use to be good Earthlings. Now, today, Ralph, we're going to be bridging the political divide. We're going to try and unpack some of the assumptions that we may have about Republicans' views on the environment and the blinders that might result from having an overly partisan mindset. Isn't that right? It's totally right. It's important to get out of our bubble and find common ground, right? And some people have really worked hard at this and have made it their life's mission to transcend these barriers. And Absolutely. so we have this guest here who's, that's part of what he does. This is Michael Jeffries. Uh, so welcome, Michael. Michael's the regional coordinator for the Citizens Climate Lobby. His focus is particularly on addressing conservatives and on finding common ground. Now, his own background is right of center, and he'll be sharing his journey on these climate issues, along with stories about outreach and advocacy efforts, particularly in his work with American conservatives. So, Michael, welcome. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. So you're really in the belly of the beast. Well, that's that's my old bio and my old titles. Um, we I have a new title, and one day we'll update everything. But it's Regional Conservative Outreach Coordinator. Yeah, really what I do is I go and I talk to conservatives, people who are right of center, communicate with them on climate issues, let them know that there are solutions that are in line with conservative principles to address these problems, that this doesn't have to be a partisan issue. I always say, you know, Citizens Climate Lobby wants to take this issue as considered a wedge issue, an issue that divides us, and we want to make it into a bridge issue, an issue that unites us. And we'd love to talk more about the work that we do there. But for my background on kind of how I got into all of this, so I mean, I grew up in Indiana, um, conservative state, and I grew up in a conservative family. I today would call myself a pretty conservative person. And while we never really talked about climate change, the first time I remember talking about climate change was when I heard about it on the Rush Limbaugh show, which my mom listened to Rush Limbaugh every day. I would I would hear it every day in the car. Um, sometimes she would even play it uh, in the kitchen on the kitchen radio. Hey, you know, I just talk about, oh, this is just this huge hoax and the government's trying to take control of all this stuff in order to, and they're trying to pull our heartstrings with polar bears and stuff like this. I think these militant environmentalists, these wackos, have so much in common with the jihad guys. Because the jihad guys have to maintain control. The environmentalist wackos are the same way. What the hell is living within your environmental means? Whatever it is, it's asinine, insane climate change claptrap. There hasn't been any global warming, not man-made. There isn't any of any kind. The number one agent causing it has increased in volume exponentially, CO2. And there hasn't been any warming. It can only be politics keeping this alive. Just vote for us, and you can save the planet. And that's how they prey on them. And they can make a difference. Hitler made a difference. Stop and think about that. So, you know, <laughs> my initial assumption was like, yeah, this is all just a bunch of hooey. But beyond that, you know, my dad has always had a really deep love of the environment. And so as a Christian home, my dad was a big lover of J.R.R. Tolkien C.S. Lewis, uh, Dorothy L. Sayers, I'm a big fan of them as well. And they kind of put forth this vision of recognizing that the world that we have is a gift from God and we, we should be seeking to take care of it. And I mean, we really lived this out. We lived on a half acre home in a semi-suburban neighborhood, but we grew a ton of food. And recycling has always been big for us. Like we didn't go to Disneyland for vacation. We went to national parks and, and hiking was our kind of like weekend outings. So that was always just really important to him. And he always really tried to instill that into me. And I think that those kind of things sunk in. Like I thought it was important, but also, you know, when you listen to Rush Limbaugh every single day growing up and you, and, and, and his, his, his group, you get a certain kind of economic theory coming in, right? And uh, basically everything is like, we need to have 
free markets. You know, growing up, I heard all about, you know, oh, we need to have free markets all the time. The Democrats just want to bring government control over our economy, which will make us all poorer and less free. And and everything is about, you know, we need to level everything in order to have exploding economic growth and all this stuff. And it made a lot of sense, right? Like we need to do this because we'll all become, you know, we'll all become richer, we'll all become, um, we'll reduce poverty. Uh, and, and the market truly has been one of the most effective forms of reducing um, poverty around the world. I mean, if you look at global poverty 40 years ago compared to today, it's, um, it's just massively changed. But that really kind of shifted for me when I started getting more into theology. Um, really, like I would say, like my journey when it comes to working and climate issues really has to do with my faith. Mm. Um, so I started kind of delving into this stuff when I was 17 or so. I was really wanting to learn more about this faith that I had been given. And I, and I started reading um, people like C.S. Lewis. And I was reading, you know, a lot of his Christian apologetic work that he wrote on like mere Christianity, the problem with pain. And him and J.R.R. Tolkien, who of course wrote Lord of the Rings, they had this, this writing group of friends called the Inklings. And they were these groups of English Christians. So they often get called to like as like neo-romantics. Um, and they they really hated the gritty realism of the literature that was being written at their time. And they just kind of met together at this pub in Oxford called Eagle and Child. And they would regularly meet with their friends and they called themselves the Inklings. And, and one of these people was a woman named Dorothy L. Sayers. And my dad had this book called Creator Chaos. She had this speech called Why Work? So she was writing during World War II. And she, she's kind of writing to people about the meaning of work. And she's talking about, you know, by coming into the full meaning of work, we can return to a, a more natural, more human economy, a more human way of living that truly values the work that people are doing, not just the, the, the profit that can be extracted from that work. And she has this scathing critique of the pre-World War II economic system. And of course, they they have all kinds of regulations on the way they have to live because of the war effort, which is really shifting the way in which they the whole economy was happening. And she says, you know, this is giving us the opportunity to really kind of continue and in, in living with, in a more a more natural, more sustainable way, in a way that values the work that we're doing. And the thing that struck me as a 17-year-old when I was reading this is that like, the, her critique of the pre-war economy was an incredible critique of the the current economy, and it and it was like, wow, we just like we just went back to exactly the way things were, um, and said that you know all these things are are actually good, and that really changed my mind about what it means to be a conservative and a Christian. How maybe our ideas of economics don't have to be tied to our faith, as if like the Republican Party platform is like on par with the Bible. And we should look at what's a Christian way of living out. As, as Christians, we would say, you know, what's a Christian way of living out? Our faith in regards to the economy. And that, that's more important than um, what the kind of political trend of the time is. Let me read a line that I just saw that I had marked in that book after talking to you earlier. It's a little out of context, but just you'll, you'll get the feeling. And she goes, I do not think we will ever escape from the appalling squirrel cage of economic confusion, which we have been madly turning for the last three centuries or so, the cage in which we landed ourselves by acquiescing in a social system based upon envy and avarice. And, you know, in Buddhism, one of the three poisons is greed, you know. Well, even in the scriptures, and if you, if you want to be a textualist about it, I mean, she is linking her critique of as you're saying, this sort of this pre-war hyper-productivist system as being antithetical to the values of Christianity. I, I had a couple quotes in there too that I found. So the greatest insult which a commercial age has offered to the worker has been to rob him of all interest in the end product of the work and to force him to dedicate his life to badly making things which were not worth making in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and so then again, so the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and come to church on Sunday. <laughs> so 
and exerting a little further, she, she talks about, let the church remember this, that every maker and worker is called to serve God in his professional trade, not outside it. And so she was making an argument, basically, as you're talking about, in this moment of wartime, there was a real re-examining of society that could be done. I read her, I, wow, I mean, it would be probably over 10 years ago now. Back then, you know, I, was, I was just leaving high school, so I was, I was 17 years old at that time. Yeah, and so that kind of led to a shift in thinking about how I needed to be living, you know, be really like, I as part of a person who wants to live out my faith fully, I need to be considerate about the kind of relationship that I have with nature and um, I, I thought about it during COVID when there was all this talk and there was a lot of conservatives, you know, I listened to, I, I respect in ways and the kind of talking about, oh man, like they're wanting to use this. This is a manufactured crisis to try to change all of our behaviors and all these things. And my first thought was thinking about, oh, well, like Dorothy L. Sayers was talking about like, we should be using World War II to pre like, this is not a manufactured crisis, it's a true crisis, but it allows us the space to recognize, like, the way in which we've always done things doesn't have to be the way in which we continue to do things. Like, we can change course. We've already seen how we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's super enlightening. How So you had these formative texts sort of informed your vision of the world and how to be in it, and then you made the connection later on during covid because yeah there is something about like the what we can turn our machinery towards when the the times call for it you know in times of great need we took our industry and produced vaccines produced masks like you can see what happens when you put society to an effort and uh i i think this is a, a bit of a digression but when you talk about the the virtues of the market one might say you know oh the thing that brought most people out of poverty recently was, you know, the Chinese Communist Party. But then again, they're not very communist in the way they've approached their economy. They <laughs> kind of, it's them bringing in the market economy that allowed so many people to prosper. Though they have a very planned one which allows right. them to make investments in things like infrastructure and transit. Mm -hmm. It's obviously also an authoritarian society and one that we don't want to model ourselves on. But there are ways in which it's not entirely a free market society and still is able to deliver wealth. And, and maybe wealth isn't necessarily the thing that we need to strive towards, right? I mean, that's also part of what that essay was about. The valuable life isn't necessarily just about having the highest GDP. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I used to read The Economist all the time. I remember reading, they would have these articles being like, you know, is growth exponential? And like, we could just continue having economic growth infinitely and like, I was like, what a dumb thing to like even... <laughs> yeah, I can answer that question. No. <laughs> right. It's, science, you know, yeah. it's, it's pretty simple. And I agree, Luke, that's part of stewardship. And that's a word we haven't brought up yet, but is not only a Judeo-Christian idea, but indigenous peoples and many Eastern philosophies uh, about stewardship, about uh, not having the um, so much focusing on that we are the boss of nature as much as that we're in nature. Mm. Uh, Francis of Assisi talks a lot about those kinds of things. Um, and, and specifically, uh, one of his disciples, uh, Bonaventure, talks about that in one of his works called The Ascent of the Mind of God. So this text was by Saint Bonaventure, who was a disciple of Francis. Does the current Pope's name choice have anything to do? Is it a reference to this theologian or is there like a, a link in the name francis yeah so he did choose francis as a name um out of a reference to saint francis of assisi and saint francis is one of those figures who has been widely admired throughout the christian tradition um you know i grew up as a presbyterian but i would grow up hearing about saint francis we didn't call anybody saints but except for the yeah. except for the theologians <laughs> that we like so the old people that we like, they were saints, but everybody else, they were just normal people. Um, so I'd hear about St. Francis. Um, what about him specifically did you hear? What was he associated with? He is associated with a radical devotion to poverty. 
Um, I mean, he came from a rich family. He literally gave up everything that he had and wandered around the streets uh, wearing a sackcloth without, like, without shoes, um, they were called. And his order did the same thing. They all gave up all of their belongings. They wandered around without clothes. I mean, they had, they had sackcloths on. They, had, they weren't naked, but they, um, <laughs> and they were barefoot and they would go around and they would preach and they would teach and they would serve lepers you know the people that the rest of society um rejected and they relied on just people giving them food and and the things that they need to to survive with our son uh my wife and i had just been showing a movie called brother son sister moon which was about saint francis so my son's middle name is francis <laughs> just from there oh that's there. funny so you and the Pope have similar references. Uh, That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And for the same reason, admiring. I mean, how more hippie can you get from the point of view of, you know, it's a spiritual thing to not go after riches. Mm. He's also known for his love for, for nature, uh, viewing all created sure. things as fellow creations of God. So, you know, there's stories of him, like there would be a worm in a cart path. And he would he would stop to pick up the worm and put it over in the grass so it wouldn't get run over by a cart. And a lot of people in the East, the Jains would do the same thing. They would sweep, you know, I don't know if you know who Jains are. They're a religious group in, in India that would, oh, would yeah. sweep away the, you know, the insects from their path. And they'll wear masks so they don't accidentally and wear masks like, so inhale exactly. a bug or something. You got it. Yeah. I also feel like this might be a natural bridge onto his more contemporary uh, namesake, you know, the guy who named himself yeah. after him. So I thought I could read a little bit from the papal encyclical from 2015. So let out a seat. Yeah, little great bit. document. So here you go. This is the Pope in 2015, Pope Francis. It is not enough to balance, in the medium term, the protection of nature with financial gain or the preservation of the environment with progress. A technological and economic development which does not leave in its wake a better world and an integrally higher quality of life cannot be considered progress. Frequently, in fact, people's quality of life actually diminishes by the deterioration of the environment, the low quality of food, or the depletion of resources in the midst of economic growth. So sort of playing with that discussion we had earlier about growth and sort of markets, but also this, this thinking of if you're only thinking about economic gain and you're not considering quality of life, there can be real destructive blind spots in sort of a, a greed is good mindset. That certainly goes along with what Dorothy Sayers was was writing about as well. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned, Michael, that the Pope's thinking was part of your journey on climate issues, right? Yeah, I had had all these thoughts. They were just kind of like always floating around in my head of being like, boy, like I wish that the Republican Party was doing something about the environment. I went to a Catholic university to study theology as well as political science. I was randomly paired with a set of roommates, and one of them had started a group inspired by Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, called Students for Sustainable Stewardship, and it was a faith-focused approach to caring about sustainability. And we we did all kinds of stuff. We organized recycling drives. We organized like things to help get people to do like reusable use reusable cups at Starbucks instead of like single consumption items. We discovered that our recycling was actually on campus was just getting thrown out. So we like were lobbying our administration to actually have the recycling bins get picked up by recycling trucks that would get taken to recycling facilities. Um, that was a tough effort. Hmm. And, you know, we organized like nature walks and stuff like that. Like it was just a really like wonderful um, experience of finding people who cared about the environment and although most of them didn't identify as being like politically conservative like and it was it was an excellent way for me to bridge this kind of I don't know I felt like I had like this like gap or a hole in my heart as I'm like sitting here advocating for politicians to get elected that like I was you know quite concerned you know either did not care would not seek to help um the environment um and it's like i might agree with you on all these other sets of issues but like on this issue which i also think is very important like i think that you really might might hurt it so it was a really great way for me to live out that aspect more fully within 
what I was doing personally. Well, to, to, to live your values. Yeah, absolutely. It's an important yeah. thing. And that's, that's how I actually got connected with this in Steinman Lobby was uh, my friend who started this group. It was a roommate of mine. He learned about Citizens Climate Lobby, which he, he views himself as being politically conservative. But he learned like, hey, like there's this climate group that like actually talks about bipartisan political things. And, you know, this seems to be like the kind of thing that like we're really looking for and like that we've talked about so many times. And I learned about it and was like, oh, yeah, like this is exactly what I'm looking for. Because what one of the things that I was given the opportunity on very early on when I started volunteering for Citizens Climate Lobby was to go and lobby my members of Congress and ask them to start doing things about climate. So like I found myself in this place where it's like, I'm trying to get you guys elected. Now let me tell you what I actually want you to do. Um, you know, particularly on things that you're not acting on. Um, and that was a really, that was a really powerful experience to like be able to engage them directly on those issues. Well, could you share a little bit about that, actually? How were they responding to this? Well, well, I mean, one of the great things about CCL is that they do give you training and sure. people who have also been doing it. So that way you're 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 not approaching it by yourself. Like I started lobbying actually Senator Mike Braun, who is my local Indiana senator. Um, we have two senators who are actually pretty surprisingly good on climate issues. Um, but so that was really kind of the really cool experience was I was going to go lobby Senator Mike Braun who, when he was campaigning, he would say, you know, actually, I'm a rare Republican who actually cares about the environment. And I was kind of like, oh, yeah, right. Um, so he was running as like kind of like the most like pro-Trump politician. He was, And he would say all the time, he's like, I was inspired to run because of Donald Trump. So I was somewhat skeptical of his claims to really care about the environment. But when I went and lobbied him, he said that this was an issue that he really cared about. It was an issue that his grandchildren were talking to him about and his children were talking to him about and felt was extremely important. And he viewed one of the things that he wanted to do in his time in the Senate was to work on turning climate into a bridge issue. Um, he, he felt that the climate was really changing. He wanted to make progress and trying to find bipartisan ways to do that. He was one of the founding members of a group called the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. It's a bipartisan group of an equal number of Republicans and Democrats who meet together to discuss bipartisan ways to address climate change. And so he did that, and he's he's done a number of bills that CCL has endorsed, one of which has been signed into law called the uh, Growing Climate Solutions Act. What happened was it passed out of the Senate, and then it didn't make it out of the House, but it got included in a budget package. So the budget package got signed into law. So the, all the provisions got signed into law. But the provisions got in. So it, it got in. And and this Growing Climate Solutions Act was a product of the Senate then at the end of the day? Yes, it came from the Senate. Actually, Senator Mike Braun was the lead author of the bill. Mm. Um, and the actually funny thing is that he ended up voting against the, the budget package that passed the bill like they got the bill signed into law <laughs> but that's just one of those weird quirks of like american well, because politics. It's, a, like, it's like an omnibus all this bill stuff right it's just thrown together yeah oh because and otherwise you need you need 60 votes and so they put everything into the budget and you have to do an up and down on the whole thing it's it, right right and so like yeah this bill that was like something that he had worked on so long and so hard like technically the thing when it got signed into law he voted against it but um <laughs> but yeah well you know that brings us up to something about real politic you mentioned this guy was really pro trump yeah, how is there is. not and how is there not cognitive dissonance there how can you say you know i mean trump the first every, there was nothing climate about Donald no he got trump. out of the paris accords immediately immediately and while the paris accords yeah which my senator supported right like he was he was he, he is not in favor of these this, yeah. kinds he is not in favor of those kinds of approaches to but climate. you know that approach is like so benign and toothless it seems to me that's just kind of flipping the bird. You know, it's it's just a symbolic thing to get out of it. It has no teeth. But maybe it was also a symbolic thing to even sign on to it, right? Um, it's like they're right, saying, it's symbolic like, of actually caring, thing, you know, and, and we're saying- We're gonna try to meet these requirements when like we all know that the rest of the people who are signing on to this are not going to meet those requirements. So like, why well, are we holding ourselves see, up to these fake standards? 
That's an assumption. Actually, uh, if everybody assumes that, that's like game theory. If everybody assumes that, of course, that's what's going to happen. And at least it's aspirational. After all, certainly China has gone a long way in terms of solar and wind. And everybody said, oh, China's not going to do it. But they've, yeah, they're have they still using a lot more coal than we like. But, you know, it takes time to transition. But it is saying something to the rest of the world that, well, blaming other people for not doing something to me is not a very... And, and of course, many people are not faith-based, but it certainly isn't what pe faith-based people should be doing, I would think. You know, it's like saying, well, other people aren't doing it, so I'm going to blow it off. I mean, that's not what the Pope said, you know. Um, right. I agree with that approach. You know, but for Senator Braun specifically, you know, you can say, like, how could Senator Mike Braun support Donald Trump? And Donald Trump has been bad for climate. And it's like, well, Senator Braun has been quite good for shifting the Republican Party to be more amenable to talking about climate. Um, oh. But like kind of one of the unspoken rules in politics is like, well, the Democrats can get what they want as long as we increase defense spending. So it's like, you know, <laughs> um, and I think that he's kind of sick of that. You know, we want to look at things like the Growing Climate Solutions Act as like, this isn't enough. Is this like planting trees? Like this is the smallest thing that we can do. Uh, making some changes uh, so that way we can make it easier to buy carbon credits, which is what the Growing Climate Solutions Act. It, it makes it, it's a bill that adds a, a federal framework to get people registered as like third party verifiers who um, can can identify the, the kind of criteria that you need to start selling carbon credits for um for private forest landowners who grow trees, um, and also for for farmers who start doing regenerative agricultural practices. Very um, important. This yeah. sounds like not a lot, right? And and ultimately, like, is it going to get us to where we need to go? Definitely not. But a really good thing about it is that you know when you're you're coming from a party who, you know, back in 2016, every single presidential candidate other than Lindsey Graham basically said that they didn't think the climate change was happening and were, were ultimately mocking this whole idea. It's going to take time for a lot of people to be comfortable seeing climate as a, as a bipartisan issue. And one of the great ways to do that is by having people learn that they can support climate bills. And, and then they start becoming comfortable with the idea that we might be doing other things to address climate as well that might have a climate aspect to it. So I think that these are small things, but they they get us, they are getting legislators in a habit of, of Republican legislators specifically of recognizing that like, oh, hey, like we can support some climate things too. And then that kind of opens up the door to what else can we do down the road? And there's been kind of four major climate bills that have passed out of Congress in the last couple of years, or bills with climate provisions in them. So there was the the IIJA, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, um, which included a lot of money for taking into climate considerations when building out new infrastructure. Um, because as the climate's changing, right, like you don't want to build a road, a bridge, right, for how the climate is today, like we want to be keeping in mind like resilience and thinking like, well, what is the climate going to be 30 years from now based on our best climate data, right? Our best climate science. That passed with bipartisan support. Then we also had a bill called the Chips and Science Act, which my other senator, Senator Todd Young, was a major player in the creator of that and the creation of that bill, although that was Chuck Schumer's bill, ultimately. Um, but there was a lot of money in there for basically trying to attract investment for the kinds of, you know, for companies and investing in kind of the critical technology um, that we need in order to build out more clean energy and going into hydrogen as well. There's a lot of money in there for that kind of stuff. That was a bill that kind of went under the, under the radar, but that was a major bipartisan bill. Then there was the Green Climate Solutions Act, like I talked about, and then there was the Inflation Reduction Act, which like basically, like those are four bills. Three of those four bills had bipartisan support and and getting them across and had climate provisions. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act being the exception. So like there is a lot happening. There's there's other things happening as well. There's a current bill that actually just passed out of committee a couple of weeks ago called the Prove It Act. What it does is it directs the Department of Energy 
to create a database that would essentially, it looks at key products that we make that are carbon intensive products like plastic, steel, aluminum, et cetera, concrete. And then it will look at how many emissions go into making those here in the US and how many emissions go into making them in places like China and India. You know, first of all, this is gonna be really helpful data and it's been supported by many Republicans. Um, there's, I think five, Republican co-sponsors on the bill from places like North Dakota, Louisiana. And basically, I mean, this will help us to come into compliance with the European unions. I was just going to say the European Union has really been forward on that. It's been very important since they do have carbon pricing. You know, they don't want people just getting around that by getting it from China. You know, right. Um, and you have to have the infrastructure to trace these things. And so it makes sense to to build that out. And to... Yeah. So, yeah, we want to have our own data on this on this information that we can oh, absolutely. Actually, you know, use. Mm. Like we want to have good data that, you know, we could bring up in a World Trade Organization dispute. Right. Um, so it's really important for us to have that sense. information. But it's also really important for us to go and use that information to hold places like China and India accountable for their emissions. Especially if they're using a lot of coal to make it. Well, that's yeah. part of what a carbon exactly. pricing scheme would be accounting for and hopefully correct. Right, for. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, right. and again, it's totally from like a competitive advantage perspective. It's just like basic economics. It's in the US's interest to collect its own independent data in order to, as you said, order this. And interesting yeah. to hear your emphasis on, on three of these four climate bills having been passed as a bipartisan initiative. It sort of speaks to these issues not being as uh, immediately sort of siloed. Yeah, it's no longer like a poison pill just to have something about climate in a bill, which is a major step forward from where we were 10 years, years ago. ago. 10 years ago. And so say more on that. The idea of a poison pill, right? That's when you put in a provision in a bill when you want it to be sunk because it could be used in campaign ads, basically painting the person as having supported a bill that does X, Y, Z. And so the climate was was like a toxic subject in a bill for a conservative right. legislature 10 years ago. Yeah, it would be a toxic subject that's in a bill. And I mean, it goes both ways, right? You have something that's key to you know, your party's political agenda that you know you can't get past. So you're going to throw it into some kind of giant package. It wouldn't be able to get past on its own merit. So you throw it into a big package and being like, well, we really have to have this money for all these programs that we need to fund. And we refuse to remove this language from the bill. So you're kind of forcing the hands of people to try to get this thing implemented. And so like a lot of conservatives will see these kinds of bills come about and, you know, you might say, oh, you have climate language in that bill. Like you're trying to sneak it through. We're not going to support the bill unless you remove the climate language. So for a lot of Republicans, like having climate provisions in a bill is no longer, no longer poison pill. I mean, it depends on what they are, but it's not sure. an immediate. Absolutely. We can't do it. Well, and that's fascinating. Even just the evolution on that. And I'm sure this is partially because of the work of people like yourself in terms of thinking about angles on framing and messaging, right? You know, as you're saying, you can approach these environmental themes without saying, like, let's save Mother Earth. You know, there are, there are ways in which that language can be coded. I can see how, yeah, protecting our nature and, uh, and our resources. Or, you know, again, thinking about this competitive advantage framing might be a more appealing way to bring these, these issues forward. We spoke about carbon pricing in general. I know that's a big area of interest for CCL. So I wondered, maybe bringing in a little bit my French perspective here. I think it's a very interesting point of debate because some people argue a carbon tax could be done fairly or could be done unfairly. It's not inherently a progressive tax, right? It can be done in ways that would accentuate inequalities and could severely impact people who depend. Like, I'm thinking in France, I don't know if you, you recall, in 2018, there was a gas tax that got passed into law, right? We made it suddenly, like during the summer, the government passed this law, it became much more expensive to buy your gas, right? And ostensibly, the government said like, oh, we're doing this to fund climate efforts. But 
internally you saw there was an audit done, only 10% of the money was going to fund any climate projects. Most of it was an offset for a tax break on large businesses. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of what the people who couldn't depend on public transportation, who therefore had to drive back and forth to work, these people who lived in rural areas came and drove with their yellow jackets, which is an example of the onerous security regulations that the French state mandated. They had to have these high-vis jackets, you know, in their car at all times. So the people were like, okay, well, screw you, then we'll put on the jackets and we'll say like... And basically they were saying like, we don't care about making it to the end of the world. We can't live to the end of the month. Like, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. And so this was a way in which something that was intended as like... The new Macron government had just come in to power the year before and they were saying like, look at us, we're doing this big stuff on climate. But they did it in such a tone deaf way that it almost polarised and made environmentalism less popular amongst sort of more working class French people who depended on driving back and forth to work because they said like, you're not even doing this for the motives. It's just punitive. You're not putting the money to help with the issue and you're just making my life more inconvenient. So I thought that was as negative of a case I could make for <laughs> the bad way in which France <laughs> tried to implement carbon pricing. But obviously you can see how there are ways in which if it's only done to offset tax breaks, then it doesn't have this sort of redistributive element. And right. I'm using language which is kind of coded left there. But I'm kind of interested in seeing how CCL would think about these sort of these debates. Or, or what you're suggesting. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Citizens so Final Lobby has primarily been a carbon pricing organization over the over its history. And we've always advocated for an approach that is what would, we call a carbon fee and dividend. And this is, you know, so you collect the money from the polluters. So it's not it's not a per liter or per it's not per gallon tax on gas or anything like that. Although the price would find its way down into gas prices assuredly. Of course but it would be paid directly by the producer. So when they sell their oil, you know, from the oil refinery, there is going to be a price based on how many carbon emissions will be produced when this oil is burned, right? So it's what we would call a, an upstream tax. And we then would support that all of the money gets collected from the carbon price then gets distributed in a revenue neutral way to households, right? So each household gets a share based on, you know, how many people are in your household. So if you get a share per person and then per child, you get a half share for your monthly or quarterly payments that you would have. And, you know, it, the price starts out really low. We start at $15 per ton. So we don't start anywhere near what some people would like to see. But I mean, that's because if we started up really high, I mean, you would have an enormous shock to, to the, the system. system yeah. That... Not only your, in your personal pocketbook, but also what it's going to do to businesses, especially small businesses. That oh, yeah. And I mean, the, the price of everything. Transportation. Up, right? All the transportation everything. that it takes for food and all of that. I mean, so we are at $15 per ton, which is about eight cents per gallon of gas, per relatively minor. Um, it would increase $10 every year. So really the point is not to be incredibly punitive, but the point is to be sending a signal to the market that, hey, like right now the carbon price is very small. 30 years from now, it'll be quite different. Um, it will help to redirect investment into cleaner technologies. And then that, that offset will help households to afford to buy these new products. That seems to me a, a big part of it, right? This redirecting invest long-term investment. And sure, we'd all like it to be boom, one and done. And, you know, but but that's not how the world works. But But no one realistically talks about one and done solutions. That's why this type of phasing in allows people to make the investment decisions and, and price right. in no, with these increased taxes, assuming they have faith in the stability of the political system to deliver on that mm. continued process, you know, if carbon pricing were coded as a partisan thing in the same way that, for instance, the Paris Accords were, you might imagine it might be a big showy thing to then undo these regulations. So you kind of want buy-in from both sides of the aisle for it to sort of become a sustainable thing year over year increases. Uh, but right. but totally seems to think about this redistributive aspect, at least in terms of not overly harming people who just depend on these necessities. 
I know that some conservatives would be uncomfortable with the idea of like, oh, we're going to give that money to households. I know that there have been numerous, actually, Republican-led carbon pricing proposals here in the U.S., and there has been for years. And so there's a guy who got voted out of office over his for funding issues named Bob Inglis. So he was a Republican member of Congress. He's incredibly conservative. <laughs> but we, we, we know. Actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, Luke was thinking of bringing him up. We- oh, yeah. So he, he supported a carbon pricing bill, which um, took that money and has a corresponding income tax cut. So, yeah, your energy prices will go up because of this carbon price but you'll actually have more money as a household because you're going to be paying less income tax. So that makes sense to me. Yes and no to me personally, because on the other side, poor people don't always pay income tax, right? Working poor who may need to drive to work, they aren't necessarily paying income tax, but they'll be paying more at the pump. I mean, if you're making Um, an incredibly small amount of money, then yes, sometimes you don't even have to file. 40% of Americans don't pay income tax. But these are the people we've worried about, right? Right. I'd say it's even more than that, actually. It's it's not just about the matter of leaving the poorest Americans behind who are excluded by these income tax focused mechanisms, not unlike what happens with being a blind spots of the earned income tax credit, for instance. But of course, perpetually lowering income Income tax reduces government revenue, which then needs to be offset by cutting government programs, right? It makes sense. You know, you lose revenue, you need to balance the budget. In order to account for that loss in money going into the government, you'll need to reduce funding to some government programs. But when you think about what the government is actually funding, that means concretely cuts to either healthcare, education, infrastructure, or defense spending. And we all know how likely that last one is, all in the name of fiscal responsibility. I think that with Republicans politically, that aspect goes over better because the income tax is incredibly unpopular among Republicans. So we can (laughs) reduce the income tax while, you know, helping the planet like, you know, it plays very well among the Republican voting base. But one of the advantages of the method that we advocate for and it's not just us, right? Like there are other conservative, like there's a conservative sure. explicit group called the Baker, they call it the Baker Schultz plan. And this is actually, of all people, I mean, the American Petroleum Institute supports the Baker <laughs> Schultz plan, carbon pricing. So, so right, right away, my, my you know, <laughs> yeah, alarm bells, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, the alarm bells goes off. Any, but, but again, that's, that's my bubble. I, I'm willing to listen. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a carbon pricing scheme. It starts higher than our plan, but it doesn't increase as much. It increases like 4% every year or something like that, which is a very, very gradual increase. And also would like basically repeal all environmental regulations for oil companies. So that's the Trojan horse. Yeah, there you go. So in case you're wondering. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. (laughs) I mean, but you could say, and they would say, at this point, it's just like a bureaucratic exercise. Like, we're not going to remove all of the things that we've put in place. For us, it's more about the monitoring and reporting and the army of bureaucrats that we have to hire in order to meet federal regulations, even though we already have all of these things. Because the oil companies have been so, <laughs> so responsible over the years. <laughs> oil companies yeah. have to trust it. Oh, no, no, we don't need those bureaucrats. That- Trust us, you know. So for some of us, that's a non-starter, but okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I just have to throw that out there, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good, good, good. I'm not holding you responsible. <laughs> the basic idea is to protect people from energy increases. And so that way it isn't hurting people. And even with that, you know, I mean, I've talked to Republican senators who shall not be named, who have told me essentially that like, I know, I understand economics, like I know that a carbon, like I believe that climate change is happening, I think that we should be addressing it, and obviously like a carbon price is the best way to do it. And what they don't say, but what I kind of have gathered is that, like, the first time I had this conversation, I was like, boy, if only there was a Republican who could introduce carbon pricing legislation and could lead on this, and they hadn't. But like when you think about it politically, and our political system has so much to do with this, is like you can support a carbon price, but if you introduce a carbon pricing bill in Indiana, the way that our primary, you know, we have primary elections where our parties will vote 
for our candidates and then the general election where everybody votes for the actual representative. You know, if you are a Republican who has authored a carbon pricing bill, all you have to do is factually show, like, the effect that this bill will have on your gas prices. And you can just say, this person authored a bill to raise your gas prices by $3 in the next 20 years or whatever. Like, you can sit there and explain to people, well, the bill, like, you know, there would be a dividend and it would offset and the market effects that it would have. And it would, you know, make it so much easier for people to afford electric vehicles and et cetera. Like, you're never going to win that debate, especially with your hardcore um, voting block. And that just completely blocks people from really stepping and leading on this issue in that way. And it makes it very difficult to move it forward, frankly. Mm -hmm. Not that there isn't hope. I mean, there is hope. Yeah, please. <laughs> yes, please. I didn't the hope was <laughs> I talked about the Pruvit Act. And Senator Bill Cassidy is a co-sponsor of the Pruvit Act. But Senator Bill Cassidy and Lindsey Graham have introduced their own bill, which goes a step farther than the Pruvit Act. The Pruvit Act just creates a database of emissions data in our country versus other countries. It goes a step farther. It's called the Foreign Pollution Fee Act. And it essentially places a carbon border adjustment mechanism. It doesn't talk about carbon pollution at all. And they probably don't want me talking about it as a carbon, carbon thing. But the point is, is that it looks at, you know, how much pollution gets produced in American products versus foreign products, and then it places a tariff that corresponds to the difference. So there is hope that if it's marketed in the best way possible, you know, you can actually get these kinds of things done. Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at it. It's sort of linking this protectionist agenda with putting tariffs on climate polluters. I mean, in a way, it's sort of counterintuitive if you think about what gets brought up there, but pardon the pun, but the, the protectionism trumps the uh, aversion to environmentalism <laughs> there. So that's that's an yeah, interesting... Exactly. Yeah, because obviously it's not framed in those terms, as, as you sort of said, it's putting the protectionism first. But circling back to the idea of the primary system in the US and the pressures within one's party... I wondered if you could tell us a little bit. You alluded to Bob Inglis being ousted. It was several years ago. I think it was 2012. Yeah, yeah. And this was kind of that peak time when anything climate related, like that's what Obama wants to do. And it was the Tea Party surge and everything related to Obama is evil. And this is what caused like, you know, when Newt Gingrich in 2008, Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House, for a time and was one of the lead Republicans in, in Congress, you know, he sat down in 2008 and did a, did an ad with Nancy Pelosi and they were both like, Oh wow. Like, it's kind of funny because yeah, Nancy goes, we don't agree on much. Do we knew? And he goes, Oh no, we don't Nancy. <laughs> but one thing we do agree on is climate change. And like them, they talk about, you know, how they should, they're going to work together to address climate change. Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. We need cleaner forms of energy, and we need them fast. If enough of us demand action from our leaders, we can spark the innovation we need. Go to WeCanSolveIt.org. Together, we can do this. And then Obama gets elected. The Republican-led <laughs> cap and trade, you know, cap and trade, which is a carbon pricing scheme, and it was led by many very influential and powerful Republicans. It all, it all fell apart. Yeah, so 2012 comes around. Climate is like, we can't touch it at all. That's just liberal nonsense. You know, as a person who grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh every day, sure. I was hearing this is all a hoax. My point about this is that there were a lot of things happening where now, like, even the pro-climate Republicans were like, oh, yeah, never mind. Like, let's stay away from this. Newt Gingrich totally disavowed his support for climate action and his sitting down with Nancy Pelosi on a couch. Yeah, within a couple years of doing it. I mean, that's the irony, right? He records that. And very quickly, by the time it's time for him to run for president in the Republican primaries, he's completely disavowed this pro-climate stance. And so Bob Inglis was in this whole time. And like he came out as being like, I think he voted against cap and trade because he thought it was a bad scheme. But he, he proposed a different carbon pricing bill, which was taking 
you know, placing a price on carbon that was charged upstream. It didn't have all kinds of complicated credit systems. And then you had an offset with income tax. Anyways, he supported it because he, he went on this expedition that he, you know, kind of saw the effects of climate change because he went to Antarctica and actually saw them pull out the ice cores. And then he also saw the effects it was having in the Great Barrier Reef. And he was like, wow, this is really bad. Uh, we should do something about this. So he introduced a carbon pricing bill and he had served in Congress for over 10 years and he got beaten. Like his opponent got like 70% of the vote and his opponent was a person who didn't have a lot of political experience or name recognition. But the big thing was that like he's supporting climate stuff. Well, I mean, that primary attracted outside interest, didn't it? Right. I mean, I it's sort of a leading question there, but my understanding is that part of the reason why this nobody was able to unseat six term Congressman Bob Inglis was that they had some support from the oil industry. Right. And the sensibly they were able to tar him with the image of being a climate activist and, and that drew up all these negative frames, as you said, in 2008, the mainstreaming of disbelief in what climate scientists were saying uh, sort of coincides with this moment. But obviously, this was a manufactured crisis that had outside money drawing attention to it, right? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't doubt that that's true. I've met Bobby Inglis a couple of times. I've heard his story. When he tells a story, he doesn't put the story as the oil companies tried to unseat me from office. Like he doesn't he doesn't frame it that way. He probably does it frame it that way, even if it's true, because like, you know, he doesn't want to piss them off, right? I mean, he needs ultimately needs their support. Now that there are many oil companies who are at least ostensibly supporting a price on carbon, you can view them as allies in the sense. Anyways, so if a conservative person in a state like Indiana was to do that, I wouldn't be surprised if there was there would be a candidate who would be able to get a lot of money from donors who would have an interest in unseating a Republican looking to pass serious climate legislation. It probably wouldn't go as over as well in the general election. But honestly, Indiana has become so red that you can talk about gerrymandering and stuff, but like take gerrymandering out of it. I mean, Indiana is so red that even in a statewide election, it's very, very, very difficult for a Democrat to win statewide right now. Yeah, I mean, that's part of self-sorting in general. It's not just gerrymandering. It's just how people choose to live their lives and increasingly just shut off opposition. A lot of districts are safe and then the real action is in the primary. Just to go back on the Bob Inglis primary where he got ousted, basically the turning point in that primary was he signed a, a carbon pledge, a Bob Inglis, and as a result, Coke Industries stopped funding his campaign. Right. And obviously the, the Koch brothers, their reputation precedes them. Right. Did they fund his, did they shift all their money to his opponent? Yeah, to Trey Gowdy, who was running against him. Okay. And so not only did like they take money away, but obviously they funnel it into the other guy. Right. And then, as you said, he won 70-30, even though Bob Inglis had been representing this district for decades. I mean, there's something worth unpacking there about that turning point. Actually, I've taken the liberty of compiling a few snippets of Bob Inglis talking about this very issue. So buckle up. Thanks, Luke. I think Bob Inglis talking about his journey is really interesting. Let's take a listen. When I um, first went to Congress, I said that climate change was a bunch of hooey. Um, Al Gore's imagination. It was all based on ignorance for me. I had not looked into the facts at all. All I knew was that Al Gore was for it, and therefore I was against it. <laughs> because I represented perhaps the reddest district in the reddest state in the nation. Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. My son came to me when I was running for Congress again in 04. He was voting for the first time. He just turned 18. And uh, he said to me, Dad, I'll vote for you, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. <laughs> it's the first of three steps in a change for me. Because now I had this new constituency. Um, my son, his four sisters, his mother all agreed all of whom could change the locks on the doors, and so I had to respond to this constituency. Second step for me was getting on science committee, but I got the opportunity to go to Antarctica and saw in the ice core drillings at the South Pole the evidence This pretty clear. Long stability followed by an uptick in CO2 that coincides with the Industrial Revolution. So I saw that evidence in Antarctica. 
Third step for me was actually amazingly a, a, another opportunity to go to Antarctica. So I went and got surprised by, like I say, the third step in my change. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to the Great Barrier Reef and see coral bleaching. And I was inspired by an Aussie climate scientist who shares my worldview and who, in the course of snorkeling with him, I figured out that we shared a worldview, that he was worshiping God in the creation, not worshiping the creation, but worshiping the God behind the creation. Subsequently, I had plenty of time to talk with him, and he talked to me about changing his life to love God and love people, people that he would never know, could never know, because they'll come along after us. Because a few loud mouths in the crowd have succeeded in cultural norming and causing everyone to sit there not willing to cross the current tribal orthodoxy. The challenge here, Paul, is it's a conversation started by liberals, right? right? And what we're used to as conservatives is they gin up the hysteria and then they drive through some regulations and some tax increases and grow government, right? And so it's natural that we respond with, no, we, we, we don't want to do that. But what if we had a different conversation? It's all about economics. You're taxing something you want more of, which is income, and you're not taxing something you maybe want less of, which is CO2. Because if you believe in taking care of this, this part of Eden that's left, and if you believe in creation care... The way it is, is we're trying to understand our responsibility in this incredible bit of Eden that's left. Um, and uh, to, to, to uh, maintain it and to, to shepherd it. We know what to do here. The thing to do is to make it apparent in the marketplace what the cost of energy are mm -hmm. and eliminate all the subsidies and have a level playing field and a strong competition. If you do that, you can fix climate change. I mean, that's, that's what needs to be done. The real dating of this uh, problem starts in 2008 because in early 08, Newt Gingrich, this, the former Speaker of the House mm -hmm. at that point, was on the couch literally with Nancy Pelosi in an ad saying, you know, Nancy says, we don't agree on much, do we, Newt? No, we don't, Nancy, but we agree that climate change is real and we got to do something about it. That was early 08. By the end of 08, Newt Gingrich was saying that climate change wasn't real. So was Mitt Romney. So was John Boehner. They had switched their position from early 08. So what is it that happened? Well, I think it's the Great Recession that happened, mm. right? I mean, what happened in October of 08, the wheels are coming off the financial system. Some people saw their opportunity. They saw the very high tide of discontent and distrust. Some people came along and spent some well-timed campaign money to create a wave against climate change, and it came over the seawall and shorted out all the climate change equipment. We've been bailing ever since. Really, it's, it's 08 is when this happened. Um, Who are these people you're talking about? Well, there's some people with some money and some vested interest. I mean, are you the, talking about the, the Koch, Koch brothers, brothers? Are, um, you know, apparently have some industries that wouldn't do well in a carbon-constrained world. And you're saying they took advantage of that period when the nation was reeling from the financial crisis to pour money toward campaigns that then came out and said, we don't believe in climate change, we don't believe this is happening, we don't need to do anything about it. Right, because what happened was in early 08, it was okay, Mitt Romney, John Boehner, Newt Gingrich, people like me, saying, uh, it, we, we think climate change is real. We don't believe in it. We believe in the, we, we just accept the data. Our faith tells us how to react to the data. But, but you know, uh, there was acceptance of the climate science at the beginning of 08. At the end of 08, no more. Um, and, and it happened just like that. Right. It, it seemed to happen overnight. Oh, yes, it did. And of course, a lot of people attribute this solely to the campaign cash, right? If in 08 people had trusted the government and trusted uh, institutions, all that campaign cash would have created a little ripple on the water. It wouldn't have come over the seawall. Mm -hmm. And so 
therefore, campaign cash isn't the most important thing. It's a factor. The cultural markers are a big deal of how people became sorted on climate issues. And I think this brings up the interesting idea of straw men, right? Because I think this is interesting right. in terms of people's Good. ideas Good. about the climate. And maybe this is largely because we're not Talk, people are in their own bubbles and we're, we're talking across purposes so you interact with a caricature of your opponent's viewpoints or, or the other party's viewpoints and on climate issues I think the idea of you know environmentalists want to regulate all your pleasures and your comforts away it's often a, a, a vocal minority you know making those claims so then it becomes you know. about you're interrogating the motives of an individual person rather than having the debate about the issues and like how are we all I living agree. and sharing this this planet and this space so I think it's political messaging to have driven those wedges because there were environmentalist republicans all throughout the like the 70s and the 80s now they didn't think of themselves as tree huggers right they didn't have those codes but i mean i think this could be interesting uh, to talk a tiny bit of history i mean this is before yeah. michael and my time <laughs> but in a way uh, i i know this is very much your expertise as well you can talk to us maybe a little bit about nixon's efforts Right. In setting up the EPA or maybe Reagan's efforts with the uh, with the ozone regulation. I also think Al Gore, as much as he was well-meaning, probably also <laughs> polarized it as, as sort of identifying it as an issue for the Democrats. I think you're incredibly I think that's definitely the case. I mean, he did a lot of good. And in some senses, like CCL was spurred on by the Inconvenient Truth documentary. So our founder, Marshall Saunders, saw an Inconvenient Truth. Uh -huh. was so moved by it that he was like, I have to do something. And we've developed out from there. But at the same time, yeah, I think that it's been a huge factor in polarizing the topic. And we're only just now kind of, I think, getting away from that. Al Gore was a Democrat. So you can tar him with that broad brush of being partisan. But that didn't inherently mean that what he was saying was going to be polarizing. The oil companies... The Koch brothers, as we've described before, put a lot of money in opposing narratives. This goes back to what we alluded to earlier. Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency in the 70s, right? Yes. Ronald Reagan was instrumental, even though he had factions in his cabinet who were more skeptical on regulating ozone, he ultimately pushed for the precautionary principle and said, the risks of this are so great that we might as well do something about it. And this was specifically on acting about ozone depleting gases and- uh, Chlor Chlorophyll hydrocarbons. So, but that's my point is it's not inherent that it was polarizing. Exactly. I think it's a little unfair to say that inherently because he felt strongly about this and happened to be a Democrat, that that was polarizing. You know, Reagan didn't worry about that. Newt Gingrich didn't worry about that. There was even a time where Fox News didn't buy that. That was a very brief period. So Al Gore becomes an easy target. I don't think it was just Al Gore. And I mean, that Nancy Pelosi, Newt Gingrich commercial is actually organized by the organization that Al Gore created to publicize climate solutions. I would put more of that on kind of the way in which polarization is moved in our politics. Well, when I do talk about these things, I always am going to start with talking about shared values. And I think that whenever I'm talking to people, I'm coming from a place where it's like, I'm also a conservative. I share a lot of the same values as you do. I think that this is a serious issue. Here's why. And I try not to be super heavy handed on science because that raises just so many hackles. And it's like, I'm not going to get anywhere when I come in and start talking about why I know that climate change is actually happening. I don't leave with science. In fact, I usually don't mention science at all when I give a presentation to conservatives. I might say, I'm not going to lecture you about climate science. All I'm going to say is that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is happening and that humans are causing it and that's going to be a problem that we should address. Typically, I start with, you know, talking about why it is that I support this. And it comes from a place of my faith. It comes from a place of wanting to pass on a good, livable world to my daughters. It comes from seeing the area that I had that was largely farmland and lots of trees and forests get turned into warehouses. I mean, that's what happened to my home. And I want to make sure that we're fighting to preserve these kind of places of natural beauty so that we can pass them on to the next generation and all the good things that they provide for our planet, the, the benefits they bring. I think that you really need to 
meet people where they are, talk about the good, talk about what you're trying to protect, and talk about the kind of benefits that could come by implementing these things rather than focusing on the doom and gloom. So yeah, I, th I would say those three things would be really what you want to focus on. There's an economic argument to like, wind and solar are the cleanest fuel source. Nuclear is extremely expensive. We should build as much wind and solar as we can handle, but we recognize that we can't only have wind and solar. And there's arguments for like developing technological know-how by manufacturing these things in America, since undeniably there's going to be global demand. You don't want to be dependent on other economies who'll be able to produce solar panels for cheap, right? You, you don't want them to sort of steal that big business from you either, even just thinking of it from like a purely competitive economic... But I mean, there's a national security concern of, you know, yeah, China does control, like is producing most of the solar panels. And so like, you know, bringing it all full circle, like bringing back like these kind of like faith concerns, right? It feels hard to get to a place where we're talking about um, realistic solutions that can pass through our political system, but also get to that heart of the matter of what, you know, Pope Francis is talking about in Laudato Si of like having then a, a true conversion about our whole relationship with nature and, and looking at our, our economies just focused on mere consumption and needing, like Dorothy Sayers was saying, are we creating useless products that will end up just be thrown away because and needing to create new markets to shove off our products on so that way we can continue to pursue infinite growth you know we're not these solutions don't really get away from that like it seems to just be like how can we continue to do what we're doing and it's like there's a real tension there right um absolutely but at the same time, we have to say, like, is climate change such a serious issue that we just kind of need to focus on addressing that now and, like, recognize the the economic issues as, like, being more, like, long-term? Yeah, these approaches can be complementary, but I definitely hear the contradiction that you're sort of drawing between ostensibly measures that are on the tinkering level that bring us towards where we want to get and sort of the structural change in approach that these thinkers brought into your mind. I mean, I definitely see how one can get us closer to the other, mm -hmm. but they are kind of distinct visions in a way. And I, I think they might be compatible, but certainly I don't know that we get to degrowth via carbon credits. It just seems like we're incentivizing another kind of growth so far. Right. Well, clearly, I get what you're talking about, Michael. What is the world we want? Michael, thank you so much for your time and your energy and your efforts. I really appreciate you, not only for your time and, and generosity here, but for what you're doing in our country, in, in your community. I learned a lot from this. So thank you so much for what you've shared and what you do. Yeah, thank you for having me on. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, people who are interested in learning more about Citizens Climate Lobby and might be interested in, you know, we also have like a conservative action team. We, start, we do very specific conservative outreach. Please go to cclusa.org slash join. You can get plugged into your local chapter that we have. We have 400 all over the United States. We have international chapters as well if you're outside of the U.S. So the best way to learn about CCL would be to either attend a local chapter meeting or to attend one of our weekly informational sessions that we do live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. So hopefully we'll have some people join us from there. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put that in the description so that people can reach you directly. But uh, well, on that note, thanks again, Michael, for joining us on this episode of Your Planet, Your Health. Whether we like it or not, we live in a world where people aren't going to always agree with us and see things the way we do. And to move forward, the first step is to listen. And people who disagree often don't get opportunities to interact with each other these days. In our siloed environments, it becomes increasingly rare to uh, encounter divergent views. And so I think we're just trying to find common ground and understand the frames that might be more intelligible to conservatives or American Republicans in this particular instance, in terms of understanding our common goals, ultimately, as Earthlings. And of course, with Michael, we knew that there were that, that it could be good faith. We understood that even if we are not faith-based, even if we're not conservative, there were clearly things 
that we agreed on. Well, we hope that we've left you with some hope. Always, that's the driving notion here. You know, on our next episode, we're going to be talking to you about the Montreal Protocol on Dozone and how countries came together. But one of the interesting aspects of the story of how the world came together to close the ozone hole is that Reagan and Thatcher were instrumental in this. And so ultimately, I think getting buy-in from conservatives on climate is going to be a necessary step. So walk towards your conservative brethren and uh, treat them with compassion and understanding. When you mentioned Thatcher and Reagan, interestingly, uh, Michael mentioned that when he talks to conservative lawmakers, he brings up Ronald Reagan and the Montreal Protocol. So on that note, Ralph, I want to thank all the listeners for being part of this journey with us. And so if you like this, feel free to share it amongst your friends. Go on your podcast player of choice and you can rate it. You can find our episode even on YouTube now and you can subscribe to the channel. Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcasts, whatever your preferred place to listen to long form audio is. We'd be delighted to count you amongst us for our next adventure on uh, these uh, stories of climate messaging and history. So uh, Ralph, on that note, I hope that you stay planet and stay healthy. Thanks, Luke. That's the plan. <laughs>